Okay, so once again, right? Can I tell you that? Uh, yeah. So here's the here's the equation. Let's write down let's write down the equation. I might raise this up. Write this up in a much so we have T I O two, right? Titanium dioxide, which is a solid, plus two carbon, which is a solid, and gives us T I solid plus two two CO. Right, right? Yes. So this means solid, solid. Solid, and then there's a gas being involved, right? Carbon dioxide. So we are given, we are given 28.6, 28.6 kilograms of carbon, and the molar mass of carbon is 12.01 grams per mole, right? And then we are given. 88 point, I start writing small. <laughs> 88.2 kilograms of titanium dioxide, and the molar mass of titanium dioxide is 79.87. So you will see that because it's, it's in kilograms, we will have to convert it into grams. So you can actually very well start writing out as 0.0286 grams, right? Instead of going ahead and writing that 1,000 grams per kilogram. Right? Who would like to do that? Anybody? Probably? <laughs> Wait, what are you doing? We're writing. Oh, well, well, we are trying to do rather than writing all this 1,000 grams per kilogram. We can actually go ahead and write. So, 0 0.0286 grams. When you multiply it. Oh. The, the other way. Yeah. Oh. Grams per kilogram, so we want to cancel. So 2.286, right? Yeah, times 10 to the third, right? Times mole C over 12.01 grams, right? Times Mole Ti over mole C, right? And so does that give us 1.19 times 10 to the third? I think we need some two to the fourth. Yeah, so 28,600. So 28.6. Oops. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you do 10 to, if you're doing that kind of way, it's not so documentation. You can either do it this way or you can either do it that way, right? Really? No, I was saying if you're doing it in scientific notation, you can't have 28, you'd have to do it as 2.8, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because, uh, yeah, so we can have, uh, once again, exactly. So, 28.6, right, so times 10 to the third is what we need to do. 2.86 times 10 to the third. Yeah, scientific. Yeah. But it, I think it's still okay. So, yeah, I, th I think you can still do it that way, right? But if to be, uh, you can do it that way. Too. 
And so if we take our calculators out, so is that what we should get get um, 1.19, right? So then we can do the same thing for the reversion in the kilograms. Now when you when you multiply What's, what's easier for, for you to do, this way or that way, in your calculator? I, I was just curious. Huh? How, uh, well, which one would be better for you? Yeah, well, which one you're most familiar with? Right? You will do it this way, yeah. <coughs> so you don't have to keep on writing the one you have to write. Yeah. And so, <coughs> So if you take a look, right? So the given amount of titanium dioxide is our limiting reactant because we can only make 1.1 mole temperature per and send to the third mole of titanium, yeah. Well, yes. I'm going to ask a question five slides ago, essentially. Five slides ago? Yeah. Not well. Limiting reactant is just the trash that we're not going to use and kind of disappears, right? Um, like the magnesium in our last lab. Uh, no, it's important when you want to manufacture something and of the two reactants, one is cost a thousand dollars and the other cost two dollars. So you want to use this other reactant in excess to make sure that you have a, not, a certain amount of product. Okay, and the theoretical yield is just... Exactly. Good. Okay, cool. You did know that. Um, okay, so anyone else uh, lost? Uh, I'll erase this and go back to the, to the slide, right? So, <clears throat> the limiting reactor and the theoretical yield, and then in the lab, it actually had an actual yield of magnesium oxide okay, that, that we got. And what, what, what uh, percent MGO, or what was your yield? Did you guys get it? Uh -huh. You got some 60 percent, so I think I think that was uh, within the range of uh, the error, so that was good. And so when we try to apply the so the smallest number of moles, so then we want to apply the salt for the theoretical yield. How do we do that? How do we get the 52.9 kilograms of titanium going from the titanium. So we calculate the moles of titanium that can be obtained from our limiting reactant is our theoretical yield. And so when we actually make it, we have, we get an actual yield. So percent yield is actually the actual yield over the theoretical yield, okay? So, so that was that is what is involved as far as limiting reactants and theoretical yield. So I went ahead and gave you a sample. So the page sixty three of your handout. Or the problem actually starts on page sixty two. Well, we have a limiting reagent and the rest of the deal. So, so we are given nitrogen dioxide and O2. And we can form NO2. I wonder if it is here. Let me see. So 
Senhor não vou ser. Vamos para a mente. Starting with 46.3 grams of nitrogen and 92.0 grams of oxygen. What is the, find the theoretical yield? So what is our theoretical yield? So, we want to apply what we just learned, right? Now we have to determine whether nitrogen or oxygen is the limiting reactant. Lewis, you have a, you predicted something, but now you have to prove it, right? <laughs> so, in the handout again, right? So we have the molar mass of nitrogen is uh, 28.02 grams and the oxygen of course is 32 grams and the molar mass of NO2 is 46.01 grams. Now in exams you normally have to calculate it yourself. Right? So you need to practice doing that. And the molar relationships are one mole of nitrogen for two moles of NO2, two moles of O2, for two moles of NO2. Huh? So you see the two, right? And here is this, here's the one. And so how do we go about finding our we're going to try to set it up now like we did, right? Finding the limiting reactor. Right? Yeah. You can use this as a guide. So, therefore, you're given 46.3 grams, right? Of nitrogen. So, we'll see first. Is it nitrogen? So then we have to multiply it by the grams per mole. So nitrogen is 28 grams per mole. And uh, then we got to use the, this relationship, right? So two moles. Nitrogen dioxide over one mole and two. Mole and two. So we have pencils. Grams and two. And so then we have <coughs> so many moles of NO2 being made by N2, which is 3.30 moles of N2, right? So from the looks of it, which one would be the limiting reactant? Uh -huh. Two point 
So which will be, which will be our limiting reactor, which one is the smaller one? Okay, cool, right? So we're able to follow. So it's, it's not really that bad if you break it down and make it stuff, it's doable. So then, we really found out that the radical needle. based on the limiting reactor, okay? So then we look at uh, what was the other one called? So now let's take a quick look at solution stoichiometry. And most of the time we're actually dealing with solution stoichiometry and you will, you'll be learning some new, new, new both of words. where you have molarity is expressed in moles per liter of uh, substance. And then we need to familiarize ourselves with two words that when we refer to a solute, whoops, sorry. <laughs> when we refer to solute, that means so if you want to make lemonade, right? So we have sugar and so <laughs> yeah, or if or we want to make salt water, right? Take a pinch of salt, <laughs> take five grams of salt and dissolve it in water. Right? So salt is the solute, while water is the solvent. The component that keeps its state is called the solvent. The component that changes its state will be called the solvent. So how do we describe solutions? Salt water samples have different amounts of salts. Pure substances can be described by a certain name. So let's take a look. You can say you have a dilute solution or I guess well, what are some examples of daily solutions? Making orange juice, you can make it dilute or really concentrated. So concentrated solutions have a larger amount of solute compared to the solvent. So the concentration is a very important uh, concept where the amount of solute in a given amount of solution and we come up with a word molarity, big M, amount of solute in moles over the amount of solution in liters. So if you want to prepare a one molar sodium chloride solution, we would weigh one mole of sodium chloride. How do we get one mole? Okay, so sodium. 23 and chloride 35, so we get 58.44. Do you see that? Um, sodium chloride, so we weigh one mole of sodium chloride. Sodium chloride weighs 58.44 grams from, from 58 plus 35.45 and you get 58.44, right? Okay, so, so we weigh 58.44 grams and put it in a volumetric flask, and then we fill it up with water to the liter mark. So here's the, the volumetric flask. And we fill it with the ionized water to the mark to get a one molar 
sodium chloride solution. So solutions like stoichiometry can be expressed the concentration of a solution can be expressed in terms of molarity. So, more tests like what this, right? So, after reaction spectrometry, find the limiting reaction for reptilian percent yield, then we go into the keyword here is molarity of a solution. Right? By definition, it's moles per liter. So, if we are given 25.55 grams of potassium bromide and it's dissolved in 1.75 liters of solution, so, the molarity of a solution that has 25.5 grams of KPR and is dissolved in 1.75 liters of solution. So once again, write down what you're given, right? Find the molarity. So here is our given and what is M? Molarity is moles KBR per solution, but we don't know what moles is, so we gotta start with our grams. We normally weigh in grams, right? So we weigh 25.5 grams KBR. We looked up, calculated the molar mass of KBR, 3119, and so then we end up with 0.214 KBR. And moles, and then per liter, because it's 1.75 liters, so then we divide that again with 1.75. So you can actually put that all in one line, right? Instead of two spots. So in other words, from here, you can, you can continue on and put times or divided by 1.75 meters to give you 0.12, right? So more problems, so I'll let you practice that. You can also be asked how many liters of a 0.125 molar Sodium hydroxide, how many liters are in 0.125 molar? And so how do you go about that? You already have the moles, right? So then you'll have the liters. So you can either ask the moles or you can either ask the volume. There are many ways of asking the questions, right? That's what makes chemistry a little different than biology, because in biology you tend to memorize the chemistry you need to learn with some understanding so you can apply apply the theory behind or you can also determine the molar mass of some some compound but for this one what is the mass of calcium chloride the smaller mass is 110.98 if it is in a 1.75 liters of 1.5 solution. So in other words, we're asking the other way around. Instead of finding the moles, we're asked how many grams, right? And so if you're given the 1.75 liter solution and then we're given the molarity, so then we get the we get the mass of calcium. So there are many ways of calculating reaction stoichiometry problems. Then we come to a dilution concept. Most of the time, solutions come out in concentrated solutions, and we call them stock solutions, and we dilute them further. So we use the formula M1B1 equals M2B2. 
for the molarity of one as opposed to the molarity of the other. So if we are given a problem like this, what is the volume to what volume should we dilute 0.2 liters of 15 molar sodium hydroxide to make 3 molar sodium hydroxide? So then we need to say, okay, I'll make this one V1 M1 and solve for V2. So 15 liters times 0.2 over 3 will give you 1 liter. So that's, that's very easy, right? Easy concept. How many got that, right? Okay, I think, I think most, most of you got that. And we could also be asked what would be the concentration of a solution. So concentration, it would always be with, with the molarity, right? So then you solve for you solve for M2. And you just plug in. So you will multiply for 45.0 ml times 8.25. Then the over 135, right? ML cancels out and you get the concentration, which is most cool. And then more, more molarity problems. <clears throat> to what volume of a 0.15 molar potassium chloride will completely react with uh, 0.150 liters of 0.175 lead nitrate. So now we have to write down we have 0.15 molar KCL and we have 0.95 liters of 0.175 molar lead nitrate. We need our liters, so we write down we want to end up with liters of KCL. So from the equation again, right? From this equation, it's very, very important here. This uh, this area, two moles of KCL per one mole of lead nitrate. Because if you don't look at the reaction, of, or if the reaction is not balanced, you'll end up with with, uh, with uh, meters of PCL will be less, right? Because the relationship here was for every two moles. And you see that two moles of PCL that reacts with one mole of lead nitrate. So if, if I were you, you see all these examples, work examples done for you. Try to write four of them. You know, some of you, you probably got it without having to redo it, but the ones that you found hard tonight to understand, try to write them in a note card. And then put the answer in the back. And then say, you know, just before going to work, you have four of these note cards. It could be in your, in your dining room table, right? or you could do it in your bedroom before you go to sleep, take a look at them. Believe, believe it or not, you'll dream about it. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I, I can actually solve problems in my sleep. Me <laughs> too, Louis? Oh, that's good. See, I'm, I'm not the only. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I go to bed with a, with a problem. I say, oh, how do I solve it? And the next thing, Ooh, I better try it this way. Yeah, not just mathematical problems, just life problems too. Yeah. So, so what happens when a solid dissolves? So now we're gonna try to look at the the micro atomic level of of the elements the atoms as they are being dissolved, right? So there are all sorts of solute-solvent interactions. So you notice, have you touched 
table saw, right? So you will right. If you haven't yet, go go home. Right? I'm going to go home later tonight or early tomorrow morning. I'm sure you have table sugar and you have table salt. See if you can feel the difference. And then try dissolving the two together and see how much water and how it looks. It's it's actually really interesting because it it will. What we're trying to explain tonight how these attractions. Uh, sodium chloride becomes ionic, right? While glucose, uh, table salt, sucrose, doesn't split up into glucose and fructose, but stays sucrose, but just separated, not in the crystal anymore. But it doesn't ionize like sodium chloride. So if the attractions between solute and solvent are strong enough, it will dissolve. And here it here it goes. There are actually a lot of cool simulations also. I, I might try to put, are you guys interested in seeing animations and so forth? I'll put the link that Pro has on RG2L also. So each ion is attracted. So here's, here's your table salt, right? It's a cubic crystal. So when water starts, you know, when you pour water on the salt, then it starts dissociating and the chloride ions gets attracted to the chloride is Cl minus to the H plus of the H2O, while Na plus gets attracted to the O minus of the H2O. So the result is a solution with free moving charged particles able to conduct electricity. So sodium chloride can be referred to as an ionic solution or an electrolyte as it conducts electricity loss. Well, and so if we have a table salt here, right, with the two electrodes, then the, the bulb will light. But if you just had a sugar solution, it's a non-electrolyte, so you, the bulb doesn't light up. So what's the molecular view of electrolytes and non-electrolytes? That, that is it in ionic compounds dissociate into ions, while molecular compounds do not dissociate when they dissolve. So that's very, very important uh, concept to remember, to know the definitions of electrolytes and non-electrolytes. So salt versus sugar dissolved in water. One is a molecular compound, and sodium chloride is an ionic compound. So then we go to another big concept now, right? Acids and bases. Acids are molecular compounds that ionize when dissolved in water. HCl, hydrochloric acid, or muriatic acid, or pool acid, completely ionized as H plus and Cl minus. But if we have hydrofluoric acid or vinegar, acetic acid, they are weak acids. And so you get this uh, double arrow sign where after 5% turns into H plus and F minus, then it reverts back into HF the weak acid. So just like questions could be true, true, true strong electrolytes are materials that dissolve completely as ions. Weak electrolytes only dissolve partially as ions. Weak electrolytes are acids like acidic acid here or vinegar, right? Acetic acid. So classes of dissolved material. What we're being shown here is uh, titrating a solution using a color indicator. So we have an acid and we have an indicator called phenolphthalein that turns pink when it's basic. So so when we reach the neutralization point. So when we talk about dissociation and ionization, dissociation is when 
anions and cations are separated from each other. And we need to practice being able to write different types of... We know that this is ionic, right? So calcium, will, since calcium is in a group two, so it will give us calcium two plus. And then chloride minus, so there are two to balance it, so two Cl. And when we have ammonium, right? Ammonium is the only poly atomic cation, we have ammonium carbonate, so it dissociates into NH4+, and we get two of them because carbonate is a 2 minus in our carbonate anion. So what is the solubility of ionic compounds? We can say that sodium chloride is very soluble in water, but silver chloride is not. It's insoluble in water, so you have a white precipitate. When will a salt dissolve? So we can actually try to predict when it does dissolve. So we've come up with some solubility rules. So compounds that have lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium, when combined with ions, they're all soluble. And if you have anions like nitrates and acetates, they too are all soluble. But when you combine silver with chloride, silver with bromide, silver with iodide, or mercurous, or lead, two plus, they will precipitate. And when you have silver sulfate, calcium sulfate, they will also form precipitates. So compounds that are insoluble in water are generally also insoluble with a few exceptions. So in the next exam, I'll give you a solubility table so you can check the healthy compounds. These, right? So you can use the table and determine whether you will form a precipitate a reaction will occur or not. But after some time, just remember that all nitrates are soluble. So let's take a look at our precipitation reactions. What are they? When a solid forms, when we mix two solutions. How, how many of you have seen that? When, when you form, when you add two uh, clear solutions together, right? So you have silver nitrate and hydrochloric acid. You add them together and a white precipitate forms because you form silver chloride. In our example here, we are forming lead iodide, a solid yellow pigment. So we're reacting Ki, potassium iodide, with lead nitrate. Two clear solutions, you mix it together, and you form a yellow precipitate, PVI2, which is a solid. So this whole equation is called the molecular equation. But instead of using lead nitrate, right, we use sodium chloride, and it still remains clear, so Therefore, we say no reaction. Even though it's written likewise, like you see some form of product, but they're all aqueous, so they're actually not, we didn't actually form, have any reaction going on. So we want to be able to, you want to be able to predict which reactions will form a precipitate or not, or if a gas can be evolved and you, a reaction does occur. So if we say write a reaction for the precipitation of potassium carbonate and nickel chloride. So potassium carbonate, K2CO3 plus nickel chloride, what would be the ions? And we would try to balance the equation. 
we know that ACL is soluble, so it's, but not nickel carbonate is insoluble. And this we will get from, from the solubility table. So we balance the equation. And then as we go down the line, so this was, this was then was, we already solved it, right? So how do we balance the equation? We learned to balance this uh, two weeks ago because this is an ICL2, so the 2 on CL, A, and we saw the A2 here, and everything's balanced already. So the balance equation is balanced. So another problem, how do we predict the, whether we form a solid precipitate when we have silver, nitrate and potassium chloride. We know that when silver reacts with chloride, it forms a precipitate, right? You see that? Silver chloride, a solid precipitate. Two clear solutions, then we get a white precipitate. What about sodium sulfide Oops. and calcium chloride? They, it stays clear because the, the product is also in aqueous form. So therefore you'd say NR or no reaction. So how do we write an equation for a reaction that takes place when ammonium sulfate is mixed? And so you see just the whole a rigorous exercise of balancing different types of equations. You will notice, some of you probably wondered why are some written this way and why are some written NH4 plus plus SO4 2 minus, right? Have you wondered about that? Or not? All the time. All the time. <laughs> okay, so from, 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 from the uh, outline of the different sections. This is referred to as the ionic, uh, as the molecular, uh, no, as the total ionic equation, right? Total ionic equation. And then the net ionic So this is the total ionic. What would be the net ionic? The, the net ionic for for this equation would just be Pb2 plus <laughs> plus SO4 minus 2 minus gives you PBSO4 solid solid precipitate. That is what's referred to as a net, net uh, ionic equation. So this is called the total ionic equation. And this is referred to as a molecular equation when there are no charges. But you will be asked, and you will see, I think, in the quiz, there are 12 questions in the next quiz, that ask you to identify the net ionic equation. So it's when you only choose the reactants on the left side that forms the solid precipitate. Because everything else is in solution. So the second line you said was the uh, complete ion? Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah. And so therefore, so there are ions, what do you call the ions that are present on the left side and on the right side? Spectator ions, because they're not doing anything, right? Spectators. So 
more ionic equations, more examples. So here are examples of the complete ionic equation. We refer to this as the molecular equation. This is the complete net ionic equation. But the net ionic would just be Mg2 plus plus 2OH gives you MgOH2 solid. That's your net ionic because that's the only solid there. Right? You got it? Good. So the ions such as K plus and O3 minus that are present on S reactants and also present as product are referred to as your spectator ions. And here's our net ionic equation. So this is clear, right? Crystal clear. Crystal clear. <laughs> You're not sure about the crystal yet. <laughs> Yeah, so much, right, all at once? Yeah. Yeah. So, there are many ways of, of assimilating all of this, right? You can do it all at once or little, little portions at a time. So, find some time during the week to go through it again. Because next week we're going to start on chapter three five gases, so totally, it will be much easier. Gases, very uh, succinct and not too many variations of reaction circuitry. So therefore, practice and practice until you go crazy, <laughs> writing different types of of uh, ionic equations. So then we come to what we refer to acid-base reactions, or another name for it. It's a neutralization reaction. Why? Because the product is always a salt and water. So here's your salt, and here's your water. And so the net ionic equation for an acid base is H plus plus OH gives you H2O. Very important, right? Acid base, neutralization, salt and water, net ionic, H plus, plus OH is the formation of water. Okay? So in solution, acid plus base gives you salt and water. Some common acids. We probably, have you heard of nitric acid? How many have heard of nitric acid? Okay, good. It's a very, very strong acid, right? Fertilizer dye. But when you mix nitric acid with some hydrochloric acid, it will actually dissolve like dirt <coughs> and other, other metals. Sulfuric so acid, we're familiar, it's in our battery. Hydrochloric acid, our stomach acid. And uh, also our pool acid, right? To clean our pools. Phosphoric acid, that's in our soda, right? You know, chloric acid, and that's us explosive. Acidic acid, our vinegar <coughs> preservation. So HF, clean glass, especially when you make semiconductors, you use HF a lot. Carbonic acid, soda water. Hypochlorous and then I wash on a boric acid. So other bases, sodium hydroxide, one of the one of the ingredients in hydrano or lye, potassium hydroxide, soap other electroplating, calcium hydroxide, lime, cement, sodium bicarb, I can use this. So instead of baking powder, I use sodium or baking soda because baking powder has the aluminum, right? Not good for our brain. Magnesium hydroxide and milk of magnesia and acids are weak. And ammonium hydroxide, NH3, so aqueous, 
is NH4OH, so ammonia water. So ammonia is a gas, right? But if you add water to gas, then it forms ammonia, NH4OH. So NH4 plus the only cation, polyatomic. So when we form, when we react hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, it actually gets a little warm, but then the solution still stays clear because, because sodium chloride just stays, uh, the salt is just aqueous, doesn't form a precipitate. So I think you know how to write molecular equations, ionic equations. We should try to look at some of the examples I gave you on the precipitation. If you have any questions here, these are straightforward to follow, right? So the equation, make sure we know the definitions. What is, um, what is the equation, the process of the equation? Then you have an unknown, and an unknown, and at least when they, so when you have, you have uh, say 25 milliliters of a one molar hydrochloric acid solution, you want to neutralize it with a one molar sodium hydroxide solution. So you put a basic indicator, human failing, and so at a particular endpoint, it starts showing once uh, the, the acid is totally neutralized by the base, then you see a pink color, and we use uh, an instrument, or an apparatus called a burette in the lab. So, some key words. And so this is actually what's involved in titration. And here's the burette. So here's our OH, here's our H plus. As we keep on adding our OH, at the equivalence point where the number of moles of acid and moles of base are, are equal, then, then we'll see a very pink, pink color change. This color here, that means too much, you added the drop or two, too much. It needs to be the faintest, faintest pink. So, Here's an example of a titration calculation. We, are, we want to titrate 10 milliliters of HCl, and it is using, it used 12.54 milliliters of a 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. In other words, as we were titrating, so we have 10 ml as, of HCl as we were titrating, we added 12.54 milliliters of 0.1 to equivalence point. So how would we calculate that? How would we find the concentration of hydrochloric acid? So we go back to our solution psychometry, molarity, which is moles of solute per liter of solution. And so then we write down our relationship so that we write down first what we use, right? So we had 12.54 milliliters of 0.1. So we cancel and then since the for every one mole of HCl, right? Is one mole of sodium hydroxide. So therefore, the ratio is one is to one. And so when we do the math and end up with the moles of HCl, we should get that. See if that's right. We get the same thing. So, so try to, uh, so then, that's just the moles, right? So, because molarity, what is the concentration? So what is the concentration of the unknown solution? 
you cannot say moles, right? It's got to be moles per liter, so you get a reporting in moles. Yeah, right? Okay. And so when you kind of check, okay, that looks kind of correct. The answer makes sense. So any questions? So now, what happens if we have an acid like H2SO4, where instead of HCl1H, now there's two, right? So this is how we would solve that. So I have to go to slide. This slide, how do I do that? There we go. Okay, so here's our problem to solve. We use 27.5 milliliters of 0.1015 moles of sulfuric acid, what would be the concentration of sodium hydroxide? So I given 50 ml of H2SO4, 27.5 ml of NaOH, what's the M of NaOH? So we know that M is moles per liter. We know that 1 ml is 0.001 liters. That, but now we got to know that for every for every one H2SO4, we have two moles of NaOH, right? Right? Because it's H2, right? For every one. <coughs> so then we convert them first to liters. And then write it down 0.05 liter H2SO4 times. We need it to get that down. So we, we found out how many liters of H2SO4 we needed, and then to calculate how much NaOH. So then we uh, use the two moles of NaOH over one mole of H2SO4 bridge, mole bridge, to give us our 0.0115. <coughs> so therefore, the moles of NaOH, because we had 0.027 liters we titrated and you see they you, you'll note that we have to keep on changing the units right so don't get into the the trap of not converting the ml into liters and to get the final answer of 0.369 NaOH. And uh, so then the last type of reaction would be the gas evolving. In your quiz, I ask also see if you can recognize what are gas evolving reactions. So, gas evolving reactions mean that in the product, you should have one that says, you know, G, H2S, hydrogen sulfide is a gas, or ammonia is a gas. Hydrogen is a gas, and um, like this one here, carbon dioxide is a gas, right? Water liquid aqueous. So gas evolution, you see it by the form of bubbles. So there are some examples in in there also. So when we have sodium carbonate with nitric acid, some gas evolves. Yes, carbonic acid decomposes into carbon dioxide and H2O. So take a quick look at the handouts, and I know some of you are. Which one of these? You will see problems like 
was on page 64, 65, and 66 also. In the next example. If you will note that the next exam will have three modules again, chapter four, and then chapter five, which is gases, and then chapter seven, the quantum mechanical atom. So three totally different topics. And what is you know, quantum mechanics? So we'll try to learn a little bit about the uncertainty of being able to predict where the electrons are at a given time. The probability of knowing the magnitude and, magnitude and location of an electron. Okay, so any questions? Feel free to email, email me, ask me. Try, try the quiz. Um.